Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Christensen. Welcome to This Week in Travel. We don't have Gary this week. Unfortunately, he is in the midst of a road trip, and luck of the draw, this happened to be the day that he was at a cabin with no Wi-Fi. So we've just had real scheduling problems. We decided to just go ahead because otherwise we will never schedule one of these shows. But with me is Jen Leo coming to us from Carlsbad, California. Happy summer, everybody. Are you enjoying your pool time and your beach time? I need to get more pool time. And then joining us again from New York City, I assume, is David Farley. Hi. And in regards to Gary, feel free to insert your own Unabomber joke right now. <laughs> but he's not in Montana. He is in Canada. Derek, Gary is doing a road Close trip enough. from uh, Wisconsin, his hometown, or where his mom lives now at least, all the way up into the nether reaches of western Canada. So we'll hear more about that. We will have Gary next week. We actually plan to do a show next week. We hope to do a show next week. We will all be in Las Vegas at the same time at the DMAI conference, the Destination Marketing Association International, if I have the initials correctly. But before we start talking to David, let's talk about a couple of news stories. There's been a few things that you need to know if you're traveling that aren't necessarily interesting stories, but we'll cover them anyway. And one is that if you're traveling into the U.S., the TSA has said you may need to be able to turn on your phone or you may have to leave it behind. Right, but this is there weird anything else we want to say about that? <laughs> no, but what's the strange thing about this is like ten years ago, I was changing planes in Toronto, mm -hmm. and I had a digital camera with me, and the batteries were dead, and they asked me to turn it on, and it wouldn't go on because the batteries were dead, and so they made me leave security and go buy batteries for my phone. This is when when um, phones still had used normal batteries, and you know, I, I had to I had to go get Canadian money. I hadn't planned on doing that because I was just changing planes, and then you know buy batteries and then put them in and show them, and then they let me go. And it's so weird. Um, so this is something that's been going on, depending on what airport you're at, for for quite a while. But um, but well, it's also something. 10, 10, 15 years ago, you had to turn on your laptop and show them the screen. Mm. Uh, that was right around the time they were discovering that well, batteries don't X-ray very well. They're they're just kind of a solid mass in the X-ray, and so you can't really tell what's inside that. And so there were concerns that inside that were, you know, bomb parts and things like that. And so for a while, I'd say two, three years, every time you went through security, you had to open up your laptop, make sure it had some charge, turn it on, show that it looked like a laptop. Um, and then I think at some point they decided that was just silly because the people who were looking at your laptop really couldn't tell, you know, much. They didn't really know laptops that well anyway. So for whatever reason, they stopped that. So this is just kind of a harkening back to that. But our understanding, or our belief at least, is that their concern was laptop, uh, cell phones that had been turned into bombs, or basically that were, you know, pretending to be uh, uh, bombs. So that's, you know, that's a concern, but they are planning to do it. Jen is raising her hand. Let's talk about it from an improve your gear standpoint. I, okay. uh, I just six size Jackery Mini Premium Ultra Compact Aluminum Portable Charger External Battery Power Pack, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of words on this Amazon um, thing. But I just bought this little lipstick charger. Mm -hmm. And um, I have not been as good as I should be when it comes to my external batteries. I A long time ago, I, try, I tried a Mophie pack that wrapped around my iPhone and that didn't, it broke, you know, relatively quickly. Yeah, mine did, mine just didn't work out for me. And so I never got a new one. Now, mine, my husband... Mine actually, at the opposite, my washed my phone with my Mophie juice pack on in the laundry, mm. and it protected the phone, and the phone was okay. So it worked wow. fine up until the second time I washed my phone, and it wasn't in the Mophie juice pack. So wow. I mean, that is not one of the benefits they... They tout of that particular device, but no, it, I'm sure it's a great device. So many people use it and love it. It just didn't work out for me for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But my husband's pack, I don't know the name of it, but it's this big, and it's so heavy to carry around. But I do run out of juice frequently, and I just haven't taken the time to go out and test or um, read reviews on the best uh, the best external power packs. 
for size too. So I bought this right. little one because it was twenty dollars and it's this big, and I'm going to give it a shot and see how we go with that. The, the one of the problems I've had with the ones that you're describing, the lipstick-like ones, I've got one of the square ones. There's round ones also, is that it will turn on accidentally in my bag. And so I think it will wear its battery down trying to charge nothing, and that I don't run into with this. So that's one of the things that I like about uh, this. And so especially if I'm at a show or something like that, I will always have this on my phone. It adds weight to the phone. It adds size, but it um, you know, also then can double my battery life. Farley, do you carry any extra power gadgets, gears, uh, when, you're, when you're traveling abroad? Nope. I never have trouble with that. Like I... I'm one of those people that wherever I go, like my hotel or something, I just plug my phone in right away. And so I almost never have issues of battery with my phone. And now, you know, not, I'm, I'm a um, longtime T-Mobile, T-Mobile customer, and now they have this new policy where you can, you know, use your phone abroad and not accrue all kinds of, like, data, data roaming charges. Um, it's kind of becoming an issue because now I'm using my phone more than ever when I'm traveling. But that said, I'm not, like, out, like, all day and all night to where I'm worrying about my battery life. So it's just not an issue for me at all, thank God. Uh, well, I'm one of the things that I like on flights, too, I flew Delta recently, and I've flown, I'm flying all sorts of different carriers, and I think at least three different carriers. I want to say uh, Virgin America, Delta, and I can't think of which other flight I was on. I think it may even have been an American flight, had uh, USB you know, receptacles, and at least one or two of those also had power receptacles for my laptop, and, you know, hey, I've got power the whole flight. You could just leave me alone, bring me drinks periodically. And I, that, I haven't been on too many of those flights, Chris, but when I get that kind of a little st- power station, it feels like first class to me. Totally. Yeah. yeah, then I was on I was on a United plane after that, and there was, you know, no no screen in front of me, no power receptacles. It was like... Oh, yeah, the 90s call. They want your plane back. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, speaking of United, United is getting in trouble. They have a lawsuit against them, a class action lawsuit, because they, like so many airlines now, are charging for carry-on bags, as we've talked about many times on this. But they don't necessarily put your bag on the plane. And the reason for that is that sometimes they just have too much luggage, especially with some cargo that needs to go on the plane. And by the way, if they put the cargo on, that if they fail to put the cargo on, they will have to reimburse the cargo carrier. They will have to pay money. If they don't put your bag on the plane, they will not reimburse you the baggage fee you paid. And so there is an investigation going on by the FAA, whether that is something you need to do, and a, and a class action lawsuit that if you're paying for the luggage to be delivered, they ought to deliver the luggage. <laughs> because basically they're saying the reason why they don't put your bag on the plane is that's the way they make more money, is by bumping you and taking the cargo. What do you think? Uh, did they admit that, or is that just what the, the person who's suing them thinks? We, I don't think that they have admitted anything, but we do know that their policy is not to reimburse the, the baggage fee. We know that for sure. And so we've had enough incidents and reports that they are you know, not bringing your luggage on, and we know that when they don't put your luggage on, they don't, they don't say, oh, I'm sorry, here, here's your luggage fee back, I mean, which, would, which would seem very reasonable at that point. If you're paying for I service... Think- you got to get the. We service. should just start bringing like bigger luggage into you know, in, onto the plane. <laughs> I'm gonna start a hashtag. <laughs> That's something. Yeah, like, we're gonna get you, you know, and Spud in the same room, and we'll see what we'll see what <laughs> techniques happen there. Yes, yeah, Spud is still still on his campaign. Um, actually, I, the one thing we sh- should say, and we didn't highlight this as a story, um, I saw in Spud's feed, and since we were talking with him, what two weeks ago when he was on. Uh, Boeing is has announced baggage um, overhead compartments that will fit that are larger that will fit a standard carry-on bag on its side. So that's great. Apparently, so, they also listen to this weekend. Spud one. Yeah, Spud one. <laughs> <laughs> so that is good to know. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is there's an article called "Is Southwest Airlines." Um, marketing strategy putting passengers in danger. Have you read this? So 
let me. This takes a little more explanation. Basically, one of the things that they are selling for their flights is early boarding. So far, so good. Which means that you can sit anywhere you like, because that's the way Southwest works. Okay, you pay for the privilege. Which means you can sit in the exit row, for instance. By the way, they are also giving free drink coupons to business select passengers, and so. What that sometimes means is that the person who boards early is sitting in the exit row and then is drinking to excess. Oh. And they're I sitting in the exit row. And so one blogger or one one travel writer was saying, hang on a second here. Isn't there another purpose for the exit row besides extra legroom that we should keep in mind? Should we have other requirements? Should you be able to get a drink at all when you sit in the exit row? Or do you have a very important responsibility? That's a great point, Chris. That's I, I love that point. And yeah, I think you should be limited <laughs> in terms of yeah. safety. I agree. When I first started reading the article, I'm like, this is ridiculous. But then by the time I got to the end, I'm like, I, total, I think I agree with this. I'm all for drinking in flight. But it's true. Like, I don't want to be on a flight where the only person who's responsible for my life at the in the exit row is um, drunk. Right. So they should change their policy. Yeah, I, I had the same reaction you did. You know, it's just like, oh, yeah, somebody whining about one more thing, and then you're reading these stories about, yeah, and then the person sitting in my exit row on my plane was just smashed, and you're like, oh, that would be bad. <laughs> I would not like that. But... Mm -hmm. Two last stories, quick stories about people behaving uh, well or badly on planes, or at least uh, something that I thought was an interesting thing. I had two stories come in at the same day, I think. One was a Bette Midler story, and one was an Amy Adams story. So we've got two different celebrity mm. stories, celebrity sightings on planes. Two and, different redheads, Chris. Okay, I, I don't think a Bette Midler is a redhead, but uh, all right then. Uh, <laughs> so we get the, the email, the tweet from B Bette Midler, basically up in first class, whinging about the fact that the pe the pretzels are small, and uh, you know, showing a picture of her holding the mini pretzels that they served with her cocktail, and how small they are, and that goes out on her Twitter feed. And I thought <laughs> United's response was wonderful. The United's response was, um, "Oh, what lovely hands you have, Miss Midler." <laughs> But, you know, and we love to say, well, I hope you enjoyed the lunch. I, and so she tweeted out the lunch. I don't think she was happy with the lunch either. So, you know, it's just basically some some celebrity on their Twitter feed, not doing anything badly, but just kind of whinging about the first class experience and is it up to her standards and all that sort of thing. Well, it just was interesting because the next story that I got that day was Amy Adams, who was also had booked a first class seat and quietly gave it up to a serviceman and went back and sat in the coach with apparently from what the observers, she didn't, she didn't tweet about it at all, but two different people saw her who had Twitter accounts and spread the word about this. One in first class who said, I don't think the soldier even knew who had given up their seat. I don't think she said anything about it. I think she quietly whispered to the flight attendant, you know, I'll give up my seat. I see there's a service... Uh, I think you see there's a serviceman back there. And she apparently grew up on, on army bases which I did not know. And then the other the other tweet we have is the person she sat next to in coach recognized her and she took a selfie with him and so that went out and apparently she he had a lovely conversation with her. She was engaging and she, he is now a lifetime fan if he wasn't in the first place. So I just love the the you know the two different celebrity stories and the two different approaches to stardom there. Which would you do? Would you whinge about the the uh, pretzels, or are you giving up that seat? It's an expensive seat. You paid right. for that seat. I'm not a size queen like Bette Midler, so um, I'm happy with small pretzels. Actually, um, is that a euphemism for something, by the way? <laughs> um, but uh, it's. I mean, Amy Adams. You know, like it was a, was a very nice gesture, and a couple other celebrities I think have done this recently. Um, they fly first class all the time. I'm sure that's probably the only way they fly. So. I think giving up your seat every once in a while for someone who you think deserves it um, is, a, is a nice gesture. I wonder, like, if we only hear it when celebrities do it, so I wonder if this is something that's been going on with uh, with ordinary people who are fly first class or giving up their seats, or is it just something that um, you have to be famous to do? 
I, I have heard, definitely heard stories of people who have given up first class seats for a family to be together or for a serviceman or something like that. Um, I think there are some people out there who are just classy, you know, basically who that is something that they would do and they would do it like she did it in a quiet fashion, you know, not make a big deal about it. Right. To who else did it recently? Didn't someone, some other celebrity do it too? I don't know. <laughs> there's a, you know, there's a whole website about um, one of your local New York uh, celebrities, Bill Murray, and the stuff that he tells people that he does with people that is just bizarre. That he basically tells, you know, will photobomb somebody and then say, no one will ever believe that this just happened to you or whatever. Right. And all these kind things it'll do, help people move and things like that. So there are definitely these interesting celebrity stories that are you know, off the radar, or used to be off the radar, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I've i had an um, Amy Adams sighting, and I can uh, can uh, assure you that she is very down-to-earth. I, I didn't meet her, per se, like, introduce ourselves to each other, but we were at the same breakfast restaurant about a year and a half ago, and um, her daughter was with her at the table, and so Cora was with um, Cora was with another kid, and I think Amy was trying to encourage um, her daughter to come over and play with Cora. And, you know, I knew that it was a celebrity. I know who Amy Adams is. Um, I, I enjoy her movies. And so Cora is usually like, see a kid, play with a kid. But she already had a friend at the table who she hasn't seen in ages. So as I was like, Cora, look at that little girl over there. She has a Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse doll, and you have a Minnie Mouse doll. And, and I'm trying to encourage her. And Cora was just like, but my friend Cipriano's right here, and he has a Spider-Man backpack. <laughs> and so she, she wanted to play with the older boy at her table, and we were trying to encourage them to play together. And, and you know, from a mothering aspect, she was really... She was really great, and the girls did get together for a few moments, um, uh, but there might have been a slight age difference. Jen, that's disgusting. Pawning off your child <laughs> just so you could meet a celebrity. No, I didn't. I wasn't pawning Easy. her off. I was. She was trying to get her daughter to play, and so I was trying to encourage Cora to be open-minded and and play as well. <laughs> but I did feel a little bit of pressure because she was a celebrity. I did. I. But I. David, normally I would encourage Cora to play with anybody. I can't believe you rose to the bait. You know Dave, you've known David longer than I have. <laughs> Remember what his first book was here. <laughs> but what have you done? What have you been up to recently, David, now that we've got you on the show? Um, I have been um, mostly teaching this summer. I'm teaching two classes, travel writing, um, at Columbia and at NYU, and so I've been sort of grounded for a while. I'm also working on a travel story about Queens, eating in Queens, so I, I don't have to go very far. I'm just, just a subway ride to my destination. And well, so, now let's, um, so I've been Chris, spending... Chris, let's back up. Sorry? Chris and David, let's back up. We might have listeners um, that need a reintroduction to David Farley. Thank you very much. You are right, Jen. <laughs> I made vague reference to his first book, but uh, why don't you give a little more introduction to who David is? Uh, well, David is the author of a book called An Irreverent Curiosity in Search of the Church's Strangest Relic in Italy's Oddest Town. And um, I met David way back when he was editing a book for Traveler's Tales, Traveler's Tales Prague and the Tre Czech Republic. Um, and now, David, that is not your most recent book, though, as I recall now. No, An Irreverent Curiosity is. But the most recent thing oh, about okay. it is that it was made into a documentary by National Geographic. I didn't um, know that. Oh, I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah, we filmed it a year ago, and it's it's out. It came, was shown um, around the world um, in starting at Christmas, fittingly enough, and then still is sporadically on Nat Geo. But it's it's been on the Nat Geo International because there's Nat Geo North America is owned by News Corp, which is you know Fox right. News, Wall Street Journal, Rupert Murdoch, and then there is Nat Geo International, which is a different entity. So this has been running for most of the year on National Geographic International. Um, and so you won't see it here in the United States, actually, but everywhere else, which is great because now I can walk down the street and not get mobbed, you know, in, in my hometown. Um, but when I go to Europe or something, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, people just chasing after me because they want to beat me up. Uh, just kidding. Anyway, so yeah, so Nat Geo made a, 
uh, documentary about the book that I starred in or was in, whatever. I don't know if you can star in a documentary, um, but that was quite fun. And now I think and I'm you also with write regularly. Ballet. You also write regularly for Afar magazine. Yep, Afar and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, so on. That's right. You sound very fact, busy. I'm pretty busy. I mean, it's I'm I make my living as a food and travel writer, and so in order to do that, I have to always be busy. Um, I have chosen to live in New York City, that one of the most expensive cities in North America, and so as a result, my main goal in life is really just to pay my rent. Um, that's all. That's what I want is to pay my rent, and I'm constantly hustling just to do that. And I have to I have to ask because this is actually something that I really don't know that much about, very honestly. And I was just at the Society for American Travel Writers West Coast uh, convention. I was uh, speaking there on technology stuff, and they did a section on pitching, because you don't just write stories, especially if you're not well known. You pitch a story. And it was a very well done se uh, session. It was uh, three editors from AAA magazines there, and they were talking about how they wanted their pitches to come in and all these things. And I, I walked away going, wow, that was a great session. Uh, there was a lot of information there, and, and I can't possibly imagine doing all that. <laughs> it just seems like making your living as a travel writer is, is difficult. And that your description of what you're doing of juggling teaching and writing and and writing books and making documentaries about the foreskin of Jesus, which is what the irreverent curiosity is, we should mention, is is it not well, except for that last part, is not an unusual picture of what you have to do to pay the rent as a full time travel writer. How do you juggle all that? I mean, how do it's it just becomes part of your life and and as a you know you as you guys this is probably true to a degree to your life it just there's no real line between your work life and your non work life you know you're sure. constantly sort of working even when you're going out at night you go to you know I get invited to some of these like sometimes media events and you're going out and talking to people and talking to editors and stuff like that so there's no real difference in my life sometimes between work and non-work and so it just becomes a part of that and in terms of like pitching and stuff you know it's just um, when you come upon a, a story idea that you really like you're kind of excited to to pitch the story and get it in some editor's inbox and hopefully get the assignment so it's you know I'm, I'm more than happy to spend an hour to sit down and write this hopefully convincing pitch about a story and I have kind of a four paragraph formula on how to write a pitch um, so now I've kind of got it down a little bit well, like every you, paragraph should have I a assume difference. you teach that as you teach travel writing. You're also teaching that whole process to people. I do. Yeah, yeah. I tell my students everything. Sometimes people ask me, like, are you afraid of, you know, creating future competition for yourself or whatever? And that's, like, such a ridiculous thing to even think about. Um, I love seeing my students be successful. And now they're in National Geographic and the New York Times and some have books out. And, and um, it's pretty awesome, actually. So I'm not really creating future competition because – people are always going to be emerging as writers and pitching the same stuff. And so I'd rather have it be people that I taught than other people. Now, I think I naively thought that you worked on one story at a time. You, you, know, you, you wrote a story, you sat down, you finished that story, and then you started another one. Right. When your career, when you're like at running on like all circuits, um, is, that the, or is, is that the term or is it all gears? Whatever. Um, all pistons, I don't know. Um, it's that you've got a story, um, you're in every different cycle of the editorial process in your for several stories. You know, like you're you've mm -hmm. just gotten an assignment, you're planning your trip, and then you get you get the edits back from a story that you submitted a couple months ago. You're in the fact checking process for another story. You're you know, and so therefore it's this circular thing and you know that you're in terms of like making a living at this you know that you're going to be consistently paid because you're in right. so many different aspects of the editorial process. So how many stories do you have in any form of the process right now? Um, maybe there's some that I've submitted that I haven't heard back from yet. So sure. like, so I, those are just sort of in limbo until I hear back. And then um, there's two features for a far I'm working on, what the eating in Queens, and then a story about um, Vietnamese immigrant cuisine in Louisiana which I'm also doing for Afar. And then, so th those I'm in the process of doing the reporting, and then I'm going in August after the Book Passage Travel Writers Conference, I'm going to Vietnam to do stories for Afar and The Atlantic. And so I'm in the process right now of like doing the pre-trip research for, for that and setting up interviews and so on. Jen. Jen? 
<laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why uh, we were hoping to get you on here, Farley, is because you are speaking and teaching at uh, two of our favorite conferences of the year. Uh, first, the Book Passage Travel Writers Conference in August, and then in September, uh, TBEX Cancun. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's actually October, and it's TBEX Athens. Oh, oh, are you not speaking in Cancun? I thought you were... Uh, unless they've Athens? added me and haven't told me yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, maybe I misread something wrong. Well, that's just as exciting for all the European bloggers that are coming out. Uh, tell us about both conferences, because they're both very special. They are. Um, I'm always happy to do Book Passage because it's a very, as you know, both of you have been there. It's a very special sort of four-day travel writing conference north of San Francisco um, organized by the great dandy Don George. And um, and so I'm, I'm teaching a class with Jim Benning. Um, it's called, um, we, we just came up with this class ourselves. It's called Writing the Big Five, a reference to the the big safari. five safari, animals safari. that you see on a safari. And basically it's this kind of spectrum of, of um, the big five are different types of, of mediums of, of writing. Um, blogging I, or writing for the internet, um, writing for magazines, writing for newspapers, um, writing memoir, personal essay stories, and then writing books. And so we're going to cover all these aspects um, of, of storytelling essentially and how – and what is the best approach for telling your story depending on what medium you want to go what medium you want to go for whether it's a book or a short memoir personal essay piece or a magazine story or whatever and both of you have written for all five of those is that right um i think jim is working on a novel but i don't think he has a book out yet but okay. so so obviously i'm going to be covered i've written actually a I, book, I was so thinking I've... both you and jen oh sorry yeah that's right <laughs> you too i was pointing at the screen but not everybody who's listening can tell that right <laughs> say yeah. say them again we've got internet newspaper magazine book yeah, and what was books it? and memoir personal essay like stuff that might run on jim benning's worldhum.com right or yeah, I've done, I have done yeah. all of that, Chris, except for um, the books I've edited collections. I haven't authored a, you haven't a authored. By Jen Leo travel book yet. Right. And I, I want to get back, and, and Jen, I want to bring you into this conversation too because in my curiousness of how one makes a living as a, as a travel writer, I, now I know Spud Hilton's secret is, you know, he says Mary Rich, but uh, assuming you don't have a, a sugar daddy you're also combining some of the list that Farley just gave us, juggling a website, you know, a, a two different travel, a well, travel website, a kid's iPhone app website, a column for the, for the Los Angeles Times, and then you pitch stories. Right. Well, okay, we're going to tie this in all for full circle because... Um, you know, I, I, I really, I trip. I don't know where I got my wires crossed. I thought uh, you were doing TBEX Cancun. But one of the things that Gary talked about this week was Gary was addressing a topic about people wanting to come to TBEX or not wanting to come to TBEX Cancun uh, based on the size or... And Gary was really t um, talking about the benefits of TBEX that go way beyond the each individual workshops. Right. And I can absolutely speak to the strength of personal networking, um, especially at intimate conferences like Book Passage and like TBEX, uh, because I feel like a majority of my career, if not almost everything I've ever gotten, has been because of who I have met at different places along the way and who have then given me the assignments. For so, example. For example, from the beginning, I got involved with Traveler's Tales because the dad I was nannying for had gone to college with them. And as soon as I said I wanted to be a travel writer, he said, oh, my college friends just started Traveler's Tales, and why don't you go meet them? And I became their first intern and then one of their best-selling editors. So there was that introduction. Then I, um, when I started blogging for Written Road, um, early days, early days of blogging, um, people met me through there. And so I had met Andrew Nystrom um, because of the Bay Area travel writing connection and because he followed my written road blog. Andrew was a Lonely Planet guidebook writer. Well, he went on to do more and more web work, and he got hired by the LA Times 
to um, to to be their travel producer for their online page. And the first thing that he needed to do when he was hired was hire a, a deals blogger. He knew that I knew how to blog, and so he brought me on as soon as he got on. So that's how I got, and then through LA Times being their lead travel blogger when they launched their site, um, people found, you know, Catherine Ham found out that I really loved um, apps and websites. And so when uh, that column became open, that's how I got it from there. And it, I mean, I could just keep going and going. I just got a magazine article with Westways um, a few uh, about a month ago because uh, Elizabeth, the editor, had met me at um, an SATW's conference. So I've actually done very little pitching, Chris. I've I've done a lot of uh, personal networking and meeting with people. And I think like what David said is when you're excited about a story and when you're excited about something and you share that. Uh, people pick up on it and I think there's ways to do that beyond just a pitch on a page is if you're excited about something and you're talking about it or you're introducing people to Twitter or you're introducing people to apps or you're showing your passion in real life um, and you genuinely care about what the other people are interested in they remember that and if they're in a position where they need an article written or something done they might turn to you later on down the road. And, and Farley, I see you nodding your head knowingly. It, it sounds like some of what Jen is saying also is you're relating to here. The the whole, you know, I used to have the travel, what is the book that used to have that all the travel editors, and you know, you used to make cold pitches, not so much really the way things work? Right, not really. And to speak, uh, say something about what Jen was saying too is like, like the book passage travel writers conference is a perfect example because there's the faculty there is so like esteemed and there's so many like great editors and writers who go there and it's interesting because I've been doing this this will be my fourth or fifth year doing it and since then I've seen so many of the students published in you know print publications and web publications and so on and I I haven't been following I've I've spoken at TBEX a few times too and I haven't really been following the success or not success of various attendees there, but at Book Passage, I, I, I see it all the time, and it's like amazing to see these students go from taking the conference, and then like six months later, I see them in the San Francisco Chronicle or on World Home or something like that, and it's really amazing to see, actually. So, And it's because they not only learned something about writing at the conference, but they hung around and talked to editors and writers and got themselves in the door to certain publications. Well, and also, if there's anybody out there, I think Gary was speaking to this earlier this week, that if there's anybody that's concerned about the size of TBEX Cancun, that is all the more reason to go, because the and more specifically intimate... Specifically, the size being smaller this year. Yes, probably. the mm -hmm. more intimate experience you have, um, the closer you are going to be to the speakers and the people who are have... Um, where your networking possibilities are. So if there are editors there, or if there are people who you want to learn from, you have a better chance of rubbing elbows with them, striking conversations, having drinks with them, hanging out at the pool with them, and and you really need to put your best face forward, your friendliest face forward, because, I don't know, I just really believe in networking because it's really helped me my entire career. Um, but the other thing that I want to say is also, writing for yourself. I really firmly believe in, uh, yes, you can be pitching and writing for other people and that's so important for personal branding and uh, getting your credentials so that you're taken seriously, but I think also just as much, you know, hopefully paving a way so that you can also be writing for yourself, whether that's starting your own website with affiliate deals or creating, um, which I hope to do soon within the next year, is creating uh, small e-books or e-guides on topics that you ch you really know or have a passion for that you can sell for yourself through your own channels. Well, it seems like that's one of the big changes that has happened in the last 10 years in travel writing. I mean, you wouldn't say that as much, you know, 10, 10 15 years ago. You wouldn't say, well, what you really need to do is you need to write for yourself. Now, Farley, you've been teaching the class on travel writing for how long now? Um, about 10 years, I think. How? Yeah, 10 years. I just got some commemorative NYU pin that they sent <laughs> me that has the number 10 on it to signify that I've been 
a, a professor or instructor there for 10 years. So, um, yeah, so 10 years, it's been And decade. how has what you've been teaching about getting into this industry that you, you know, that you love, how has it changed in that 10 years? Um, not, I mean, I, not what I, I, I teach like kind of some nuts and bolts writing things, like how to be a better writer. Mm. And so that hasn't changed at all. Um, I have brought in like, you know, every, it's a 10 week class. And so every week I lecture on a different aspect of writing or travel writing. Um, and then there's a workshop involved too. Um, I have brought in like a, a lecture about writing for electronic media or blogging and stuff like that. But otherwise it hasn't changed that much because, um, ultimately, you know, like what's not going to change in this whole aspect is how to be a, how to be a good writer, how to improve right. your writing, and so that's really my approach to the to the classes is that, okay. um, I, you know, and I people ask, I basically leave some things up to questions. Like people will ask me sometime during the semester, like what's the validity of self publishing these days, and you know, I'll, I'll give my spiel about how how it used to be like kind of sh like sort of shameful or like you didn't do it because it seemed like what was implied is that no, none of the gatekeepers would would accept your book, so you're publishing yourself. And right. now that's not really the case. Now people are intentionally like the whole appeal of blogging is that the one of the appeals is that there are no gatekeepers. And so it's more and more accepted that to self publish your own book is totally fine and acceptable um, in ways that it wasn't ten years ago. Right. Well, now and we're public... seeing people who could get deals self publishing for financial reasons. Right. But there's also there's also book agents, literary agents that are mm -hmm. working with authors for ebooks. And I think that's a brilliant merger. There's publishers that are keeping their eye on self-publishing hubs uh, or networks for finding content and quality writers for their next book deals. Well, and I'm more and more hearing the complaint of people who go into a publisher saying, "I've got a book I'd like to publish it," and the publisher saying, "Well, where's your audience?" Oh, well, yes, absolutely. It used, to, it used yeah. to be the assumption was that that was the publisher's job. The publisher would find right. the audience for your wonderful work, yeah. and now the publisher, you you know, whether, it, whether it just means they're getting lazy or not, uh, I mean, I've heard some critique that, uh, that that is not what they should be doing, but that is what they're doing in many cases is they're assuming that you did already build up your blog, your podcast, your video series, your whatever, your TV show, uh, you know, and that you are basically your, you know, your documentary film on National Geographic about the foreskin of Jesus. You know that you have used that to build up your platform already. Um, but interesting. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and but that's that's something that has been true for I don't know maybe a decade or so now. Mm -hmm. Like when my book came out five five years ago, I had a publicist from Penguin that was assigned to me, and it was her job to get me publicity. But she didn't hardly did any of it. In fact. I'd say 90% of the interviews I got and the, the, the like, you know, radio interviews and, and print interviews and everything else was from me and milking my connections and asking friends of friends to set, you know, meet, introduce right. me to this person and so on. So, so even five years ago, I was doing most of the publicity for myself for, for Penguin, you know, it's like this huge multinational right. publisher. Well, I mean, one of the reasons for that I I see on my side because I you know do a couple podcasts and things I get pitched things all the time by publicists for books especially who who clearly are just clueless um, mm -hmm. in terms of you know they're pitching me stories that I would never ever do um, or they're pitching me you know basically to interview authors as if that were something that I did so you know that it's just it's just scattershot it's not like you know, a good PR agent is usually milking their network. You know, they are the ones who they have basically built up over time their own network, and so you're often getting this handed off to a junior person who doesn't have a network and really is just using email lists and a uh, very untargeted way. So that's not going to be very effective. So exactly. I mean, when I saw the 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 media mm -hmm. list um, that my publicist sent me of who she was pitching, it was um, there was friends on there. And I'm like, oh, you know, what is what is she doing as the travel editor at such such magazine? And then I found out that she left that job five years ago. So her <laughs> list is like, you know, this list was incredibly old. So yeah, it's funny. Uh, I think if we're, I mean, we could have a whole other discussion on uh, marketing, especially book marketing. But I think as you're so excited and writing your book, you need to be spending an equal amount of time researching the arena of 
where mm -hmm. you want it to sell and not leaving everything up to the publishers. Your book buzz has to begin well in advance of the book being published. Right, David? I mean, one of the things yeah. is one of the things that when I was working in travel book pub publishing is um, I got to help with uh, virtual, um, oh gosh, I already forgot the name. It's like a vir virtual book tour, virtual book tour. Mm -hmm. And so you set up with different bloggers and websites and podcasts in a concentrated amount of time like you would do an in-person book tour at the brick and mortar bookstores. Right. You do the same thing online. And, um, you know, that's where something, you know, that's where Farley, you have all your friends who have all these different travel websites and have their platforms and their podcasts. That's when you can line it up for your what for your book promotion. Yeah, it's well, true. It's all, I mean, all timed out, too, to try and come together at the right time, too. Right. You do it in a concentrated yeah. period, uh, usually two weeks. Weekday. Well, I know, for instance, uh, Pauline Frommer, they've just got their new series of books come out, and they've got a new book on New York. And New York has changed quite a lot, actually, in the last 10 years. So I, I pinged Pauline, and I said, I'd love to have you back on Amateur Traveler to talk about that. And she said, well, we just sold out. So wow. <laughs> now is not the right time. Can we do it in the fall because we're going to do a second printing? It's like, sure, absolutely. You know, the, That's as good a time to do a story about a, a New York as right now would be. So, But you know, she's basically having to think, as the publisher especially, you know, you don't want to get the, the publicity and then not have people be able to go out immediately and, and you know, go to Amazon or go to, you know, if there are brick-and-mortar bookstores, to go to one of those and buy them. Anyway. Exactly. And can I just bring up um, the TBEX thing one more time because we just haven't mm -hmm. gotten to it? Is that um, the TBEX Athens, where I'm I'm speaking about freelancing, the freelance life, but I'm also teaching. Do, we're doing something kind of unique this time. Uh, the woman who organizes it um, asked me if I would teach a two-day writing class before, like two days before before the start of the conference. So, students, it's an individual fee. Like it's not part of. The fee that you pay to get in TBEX, it's like I don't know how much it is. Maybe it's I think it's two hundred dollars a student, and um, and it's a two day writing workshop that I'm going to be teaching in Athens for TBEX, and that should be a lot of fun actually. So it'll be like the, the, I think there's a maximum set at ten students, mm -hmm. and so it'll just be the ten of us, and they'll submit writing in advance, and and we'll be able to read it and workshop it, and hopefully get it into some kind of publishable state if it's not already, or just make it much better as the hope. Okay, yeah, they've so done that the last couple times, uh, and and that's growing. They're seeing more and more interest from that, so they're doing that now. Yeah. Jen, sorry. Yeah. Now, David, all right, so you're getting their work um, in advance of the class, or while they're in Athens, are you going to be conducting a live uh, travel writing, researching a story experience in Athens? No, it'll, there's not enough time to do that because it's only two days, so... I'm going to ask for their work in advance and read it and have some comments. And I think I might distribute it, everyone's work to each other, so we'll all be able to comment on it. It'll be like kind of a sort of classic writing workshop. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. I love that stuff. I yeah. love hands-on uh, tutorials. Yeah. But in, my, in my writing classes in New York, though, I, I, I make them research and write a travel story about New York. Because you have And that's weeks. kind of fun. Well, finally, exactly, in case yeah. we have any listeners who want to, who are close to New York or want to attend your uh, classes in New York, or at Book Passage, or in Athens, uh, give us the the where they can find out this information or what when the dates are, especially. Right. Um, let's see. Book Passage is what August fourteenth, seventeenth. Usually. Um, yeah, I think it's August fourteenth, seventeenth. Um, Tbex is like. Um, I don't have the exact date. Sometimes in sometime in the twenties of October. Uh, uh, October twenty third to twenty fifth. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But this will be just before then. So the workshops like are the twentieth and twenty first. Right. And then and, there's um, a day of uh, trips on the twenty second before the regular conference starts. And I'm also teaching a one day travel writing class at NYU the first weekend of October, actually. And then that's it. And then I I only teach semester long classes usually in the spring. Because if I taught all the time, I'd never be able to go anywhere. So I wouldn't really be a travel writer. I'd be like a travel writing teacher, which is not what I want to be. I just teach because I really like it. Um, and I'd rather be a writer, though. So. so where can people follow along with... Do you have a website that you uh, you let people know about? 
I oh, have an irreverent curiosity. Yeah, or it's my, my website's really just dfarley.com. Um, when I got it, David Farley was already taken by like a, a funeral home, actually. <laughs> and so I had to go dfarley.com, and it's really just like a depository of like my published stories. It's, it's more like just a professional writing website so editors can see who I am and what I've done. You know, and I, don't, I only update it when I have a new story out. So um, otherwise, there's like Twitter, you know, David, at David Farley. Sure. Um, and if and people are interested in, uh, you can go to bookpassage.com if you're interested in the Travel Writers and Photographers Conference. Um, and you can go to uh, tbexcon.com if you're interested in the Tbex conferences. Excellent. One, one last word to finish up what Jen was saying. So we alluded to Gary's article. So Gary wrote something in a travel blogger's Facebook page, basically, with people who were whinging that TBEX was going to be smaller this year, saying, well, hey, you were complaining it was too large last year, so get over it. But, but then also going on to talk about how it's similar to what Jen was just saying, how every time he has gone, he has made connections that have led to interesting things, including This Week in Travel, because we all met at the first, first T-Bex, T-Bex conference. where there were only a hundred people in Chicago. Right, and I and I just learned this week actually that one of the people who was a judge for the Smitty Awards at Travel and Leisure that both Gary and now and I have now won was a previous guest on This Week in Travel, and basically I think got learned about me through this show, and so I think. I can also say that a lot of good things have come out of networking at shows like, especially, uh, especially TBEX, as including, of course, this show. So there we go. With that, uh, Jen and Farley, do you have tips for us this week? Take it away, Jen. Take it to the bridge. Okay. Um, so I got an email uh, today from one of my... Uh, Favorite websites. Now, this is has nothing to do with apps. It has a little bit to do with travel, um, but I have a, a, a crush on Airstreams, you might say, and an even bigger crush on a company um, called Hoffman Architecture, and their website is uh, H-O-F-A-R-C. Um, dot com. And what they've done is they restore vintage Airstreams with a mid-mod uh, feel, and um, Wait, what I found out from... What that what that means, Jen. They restore vintage Airstreams with a mid-mod... Oh, well, it's, they're, they're sort of keeping the vintage... Um, they're keeping the vintage feel of the Airstream, but they're okay. putting in modernized uh, features and appointments. So you're really, they're trying to make it seem like you're walking into a hotel room. And uh, what I, I used to look at their page um, in their classified sections because they would sell these completely souped up Airstreams, and I would just sit there and drool over them. Um, they can get quite expensive. Well, it turns out that they... Um, they made their own Airstream camping park in Santa Barbara, and they were just on the TV show Extreme RVs on the Travel Channel. Well, I didn't even know this show existed. So if you are interested in RVs or even just specifically Airstreams, um, Hoff Ark is featured on the Travel Channel Extreme RVs, and they take you through one of their renovations. And it's really, really cool. And, of course, I want to go hang out at their Airstream Travel Park in Santa Barbara now. And can you spell the website? H-O-F-A-R-C. Arc. Okay. Dot com. It's after their name, Hoffman Architecture. Got it. Oh. But Hoffman nope, Architecture, it turns out, was already being used by a funeral home. So. Hold on. That didn't <laughs> work. Hold on. That didn't work. Okay. Uh, while you're finding out the real uh, URL for that, uh, Farley, did you bring a tip for us? I did. Um, my tip, my travel tip for the week is that there's a new museum that's opened up in Brooklyn, um, and it's quite interesting. It's called the Morbid Anatomy Museum. And so I think that it's pretty self-explanatory what it is, but it's like, you know, kind of like rogue, weird taxidermy, anthropomorphic taxidermy. There's, like, there's a whole display on um, anthrop anthropomorphic mice 
you know, like mice, taxidermy mice set up like with top hats and dresses and stuff like they're going to a ball. Um, and there's all kinds of just weird sort of oddities and stuff that you might find um, at a place like, like the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia is famous for this sort of stuff. And so um, now to get your sort of morbid fix, um, one doesn't have to go to Philadelphia. You can go right to uh, Brooklyn, New York to see some of this kind of weird stuff. And it opened um, two weeks ago. So it's brand new, and it seems I haven't been yet. I've been I've been spending my weekends going out to Queens to eat, so I haven't been able to 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 go to the Morbid Anatomy Museum yet. But it's um it's morbidanatomymuseum.org if you want to find out more about it. And is there a little sneak peek of what you're what you're discovering in Queens, your your favorite restaurant you've discovered so far, or your, um, or your uh, most morbid? I'm not sure which, but. <laughs> well, the beauty of Queens is the most ethnically diverse um, county. In the United States, and they speak 140 languages there. When you get money out of the ATM, uh, 16 language choices come up, um, and so it's it's just amazing that. You, and I'm so I'm eating my way down the number seven train um, from Long Island City to Flushing, and there's different like ethnic neighborhoods all along the way. So I'm getting out and eating, and there's just some like in Flushing, it's kind of amazing. You know, there's we we know like five different types of Chinese cuisine, like Americans do, you know, sure. Hunan cuisine, Sichuan, Cantonese and stuff. But there's so much other, such a diverse range of Chinese cuisine that we don't normally eat because it's not represented here. But in Queens, you can you can go to Flushing, the big the great Chinatown there, and you can eat like Dongbei cuisine, which is, Dongbei is a region that's north of North Korea. And it used to be called Manchuria, most people notice that. And, you know, it's, it's Chinese food like you've never had it. You're like, whoa, these, these grilled ribs are, you know, Chinese, but yes, they are. They're from Dongbei. And so you'll find stuff like that in, in Queens, all kinds of sort of unique restaurants that you wouldn't normally find elsewhere, except for in the place where they, they come from. Hmm. And speaking of eating and you eating your way around New York, I saw on Twitter that you participate in eatwith.com. I do. Yeah, I did it for a story for Bon Appetit, um, but I've okay. done it a couple times since then. And it's like a, a service where people, usually travelers, um, sign up to eat at someone's house so they can have like a kind of a real experience of what it's like to eat with someone um, who lives in that place. You know, it's sort of different from a restaurant. So yeah, so like maybe once another month, I turn my apartment into a restaurant for six or seven people. I did it a month ago. I had three Norwegians, two Dutch, and one Israeli, and it was fun. And by the end of the night, we were all just, you know, completely drunk, but all great friends. What, um, what have you cooked during this time? I usually cook, I, I set a menu, put it on my profile, and people can sign up. You know, because I lived in Rome for a couple of years working on my book, I, I do kind of a Roman sort of menu with carbonara, um, and uh, I do like a farro salad. It's, it's a little bit different. It's, it's not classically Roman, but I do like a farro salad with bacon and kale um, and a few other things, like put out lots of cheese and salumi and so on. Um, I provide the Negronis and the wine. It's pretty fun. I'm going to twist your arm okay. in October when I come out there. Okay. It can. it can be twisted. You'll just have to sign up. It's on his website. <laughs> <laughs> My tip this week is a gadget, and I'm, and I'm going to show, for those of you on the video here, I'm going to uh, scan over here and see if you can see it. But uh, there's a little device here in my house, which is the size of a glowing hockey puck. And hang on a second, let me... Over there. I don't know if you can see this little device over here. It has got a blue line around the outside, and it's connected to a hard drive. It is a transporter. And a transporter is basically a $100 device, I think I got it for $75, that is the ability to make your own cloud. Um, so you can do something like Dropbox, where you can keep all, you know, you can have a portion of your hard drive that is cloned and always backed up constantly to the cloud. It's just that the cloud is here in my office. And if I get another one of those and I put it down in my son's uh, apartment, for instance, then I can have them talk to each other and I can have my backups backed up to his computer or to his transporter, rather. And so it's just an interesting way to have backups while you're on the road and have them potentially even be backed up from there to somewhere else if you get uh, two of them and set them up in different places and have off-site backup. And your files are never entering anybody else's computers. Yeah, Jen. Here's a question, Here's a question yes. for you, Chris. Could you then, say you were doing a home exchange, 
um, as my friends are doing from uh, Del Mar to Stockholm. Yep. I asked her if she was taking her computer, and she said no, which I was so, so shocked about. There's no way I could be gone a month and not take my computer, no matter how much I did or didn't use it. Could I take the transporter instead, instead of my own personal laptop, just take my transporter with my files and use it with the, the other person's computer wherever I was staying? You could use it with the other person's computer, but you wouldn't have to do. You wouldn't have to necessarily leave. I believe they have a web interface you could get at your files uh, from anywhere. Although, don't I would look that up before you buy it because I haven't used that because I'm always doing it through either through my um, my phone because the phone can also get at those files. There's an app on the iPhone, for instance, that can get at the transporter files or through my laptop, because I don't travel without a computer. But I think there may also be a web-based interface. But I know you can get it from the phone, so you get access to all those files. And how much is it? Uh, it's $100, $75. You can find it on sale like I did. And it's from the people who make Drobo, and I don't know if you know those. Actually, sitting right next to it is a Drobo, which is a big honking way to back up uh, files uh, it's a way to do secure storage. So hopefully someday they'll get those to talk together so I can have not just 2 terabytes worth of backup, but 15 terabytes, which is what I've got in my Drobo space. So Which is where I keep all of these shows and all the amateur traveler shows that I've done throughout history, for instance, because I need lots of storage for backup. Farley, I think we've already talked about where we can find you online. Do you want to throw anything else to that list that you gave us previously? Jen no, just a little bit on that. dfarley.com and at David Farley on Twitter. But okay, I think that's and it. not davidfarley.com. You have no. not changed your business. Unless you're interested in funeral services. There we go. Jen, where can we find you online and what is new at jenleo.com or in your growing internet domain? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at, at jenleo. Uh, when Chris is talking about my growing internet uh, opolis, um, Genopolis. Uh, I've started, I don't know if we've mentioned it here before, but I've started doing Twitter parties with a family travel focus with hashtag kids and trips. So just this past week, um, we gave away two nights at the Hyatt Maui amongst other Maui gifts for Kanapali uh, Beach Association. And so we are doing these every two weeks, the second and fourth uh, Thursday mornings. Um, 9.30, around 9.30 Pacific time, and we'll be doing one again in two weeks, so July 24th, um, with American Express, and we'll be giving away uh, $100, $200, and a couple $100 um, American Express cards as we talk about uh, summer road travel. And we should say that uh, Jordan, who's been on the show, uh, mentions in the chat room that he's he's on the fence about going to Book Passage. So, Farley, you get one last chance to pick to ditch Dick here about uh, why you should go to Book Passage. <laughs> um, because it, it has, you know, the best travel writers in the world are on staff there. And what's great about it is that we're all kind of stuck at Book Passage in Corte Madera. And um, not that we would want to go anywhere, but you've got this great faculty, and they're there for all the four days, and they're hanging out. There's a wine bar or a cafe in the, where it's at, and so long into the night, you've got these, um, you've got access to this great faculty, um, and they're there. And John George only picks people in the faculty, I think, who are willing to like give their information and their time to people who aren't going to hibernate in their hotel room the whole time. So you, for four days, you've straight, you've got this great knowledge of writing and travel writing right there and you can just go talk to any of them it's pretty great and there's no preference like and the special the uh, one of the special spotlight faculty members this year is Tony Wheeler right Farley I'm looking at the book yes, passage true. page and it says Tony Wheeler is a part of the faculty and they're gonna have an evening uh, with him um, and Don George is gonna interview him and um, I don't yeah, know the guy who started Wheeler Lonely Planet is. Oh, the guy who started Lonely Planet. Sorry, I just drew a blank. I've been reading his book. I should know that. <laughs> and then, and a and shout Sue, out to Susan Fitzgerald, who's been trying to watch the show, even though her electricity just went out for the third time this week. So, the uh, it, as we wrap this up, the in new on Amateur Traveler this week. Uh, well, two things. One, did we mention that we're doing an Amateur Traveler Morocco trip next April? I don't know if I've mentioned that on the show. No, we haven't heard we about that. That's are exciting. are doing um, two different trips, one with me and one without me, because 
the listeners revolted and wanted to do a 15-day trip. So there's a 15-day trip to Morocco, uh, which will meet up then. I will go a day early and say hello to them as they leave, and then we'll start a 10-day trip uh, in April. The 10-day trip starts April 11th, and the 15-day trip finishes April 10th or 11th uh, of next year. So you can go to Amateur Travel or look on Book Travel and uh, if you want to join me in Morocco. Uh, this week's show actually is on Paris. We're going back to the City of Lights. And the reason, one of the reasons I bring that up is if you like podcasts, there are some new travel podcasts. And despite the fact that they are competition, uh, kind of like Farley talking about, don't you? Why do you encourage people to be competition? Uh, there are other good travel podcasts out there, and one that I'm enjoying right now is Join Us in France, a very detailed podcast on France and quite often on Paris. And I invited uh, the two hosts of Join Us in France to come on to Amateur Traveler and talk about Paris. So uh, you can listen to that, amateurtraveler.com. With that, any last words before we sign off? Let us know if you're going to be in Vegas next week. We are yeah, trying to put together a live show. Yeah, if we can put together a live show or put together a meetup at least, uh, we'll let you know on social media, uh, probably on the This Week in Travel Facebook page, if nowhere else. We don't have finalized plans for that. I'm sorry we don't have them sooner, but <laughs> Life is complicated. Uh, any any words of greetings out to Gary uh, Farley? Uh, the Ted Kaczynski of travel. The Ted Kaczynski of travel. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I can't get over the, the, the cabin sort of thing. Um, hi, Gary, and look forward to you being on next week. And, um, and a message to anyone who's listening, let us know if you're out of New York City next week and if you want to go out and eat with me in Queens to do research for this story for a far magazine, um, you can gladly come out with me. Excellent. Fun. Now I feel left out that I will not be in there next week. Uh, with that, we'll end this episode of This Week in Travel. For, uh, for Ali, thank you for, for joining us. Jen, thank you for being reliable. And Gary, we're sorry we missed you. Uh, go out there and travel this week and try to discover how many different types of Chinese cuisine are in your neighborhood. <laughs>